Welcome to Around the World in Events, connecting ideas, news and trends from across all regions. We have so much to learn from different cultures, organisations and professionals, but we often stick to what we know and are familiar with. With Around the World in Events, we connect the dots from across the globe, bringing you ideas to inspire, excite and to learn from. As we are living through the greatest disruption of our industry, the global COVID-19 pandemic is forcing us to change. Through this series, we are following leaders from around the world to understand how this pandemic has affected their industry and highlighting the opportunities through and out of this pandemic, bringing you a true representation of how the world is coping. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Paul Raggett from the UK. Paul is the events director from London Canna Group, organisers of the Europe Canna Expo event series in Dublin, London and Zagreb, covering the latest research and developments in CBD, can cannabinoids and medical cannabis. Paul has an extensive background in international conference and exhibition market, building long-term partnerships with government bodies, academic institutions and global brands. Joining us from the UK, where currently, as we record this, there have been 294,792 reported cases of COVID-19 and 45,300 deaths. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Libby. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. No worries. Um, look, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Talk me through your experience in the events industry, your scope, specialist area. What have you been doing? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I basically, uh, I've been in events since 2004. Um, I actually started off as a salesman when I was at university, so I've had quite a few sales roles and, uh, yeah, moved into the event space in 2004, running um, events in the life and biomedical sciences. Um, so I started off um, doing delegate and exhibition sales for actually two events, one in London and one in Geneva. And uh, I then moved up to become the exhibition manager within that organization after a couple of years. Um, and we increased our portfolio up to about, at that point, probably about nine or 10 events a year. So we used to cover everything from stem cell research all the way through to genetic engineering, point of care diagnostics, uh, drug discovery research. So everything that you would think of for the pharmaceutical industry, the, the sort of... Uh, side of things, so pharma, biotech, that type of thing. So um, yeah, we increased our portfolio quite dramatically, got up to around about uh, 20, 25 events. Uh, I then became the director of sales and marketing for the organization after about four years, five years. Um, and again, the number of events increased. We got up to around about 35 events. We were running all of those out of the UK, so it involved a hell of a lot of traveling. Uh, we expanded across from, obviously, from the UK to Europe, North America, uh, India, China, uh, Singapore, Korea, and an event down in Brazil as well. So the, the actual number of events sort of uh, increased, as did the audience numbers as well. So we would be looking anything up to about, well, our largest event was around about 2,000 people. We held that as a lab automation event in Hamburg, Germany. That was back in 2008, I believe it was, 2009, something like that. Um, so, yeah, we used to run everything out of the UK office, um, but the numbers were quite high. So you're looking anything up to about 150 exhibitors. The average was probably 50 or 60 exhibitors for the events. Um, we'd also have training courses, business tutorials. We used to produce market reports as well. So everything in a particular sector of the industry. Um, and then we opened a new office in, uh, where was the first one? We opened an office in India, in Chandigarh, so near New Delhi. Uh, that was where we used to have all of our database management team as well. Um, we then launched a new office in the States. We opened an office in San Francisco um, and I carried on running all of the European and Asian events because we kept India pretty separate. India was pretty much its own entity, really. 
Um, so yeah, I used to run all the Asian events and the European events. And then back in, oh, when was it? 20, 2012, I think it was. Yeah, I bought the franchise for Asia. So I then moved over to Singapore and took responsibility for all of our Asian operations. Um, so I used to run everything. I actually ran the first bioprinting event in Asia. So that was pretty good. Yeah, uh, we used to do a lot of stuff on point of care diagnostics, uh, genetic research, that type of thing. And we would partner a lot with the Singapore government agencies because it brings a lot more credibility to our event. And yeah, we had quite a good we had quite a good track record. We'd worked with them for quite a while. So um, yeah, I ran all the events out of Singapore. Um, I then moved over to Cambodia and lived in Cambodia for a couple of years and again just ran all the events from there really because it's a little bit cheaper to operate from Cambodia than it is from Singapore. It was still a Singapore operation but uh, yeah I decided to base myself in Cambodia. Um, I then uh, ooh, I closed up that operation in 2017 and moved back to the UK and was pretty much a sort of event management consultant with a few clients for about 18 months to two years. And then I joined London Canna Group back in January of last year. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the background. And obviously, London Canna Group, we run events for the CBD, cannabinoid and medical cannabis space. So it was a nice transition for me from running educational events geared towards pharmaceutical researchers and government researchers to actually sort of marry the two areas and do, you know, we're providing educational events, but not just for high level researchers. It's also for patients and consumers as well. So the whole idea is to get people to have a proper understanding of the benefits of cannabinoids and medical cannabis in general. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at now. And uh, we ran our first event in London uh, last June, and it was really successful. We had some great feedback. We had about 3,500 attendees, uh, 80 exhibitors, 40 speakers on the program with panel discussions. And, um, yeah, so we had big plans for 2020. Wow. Mm. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I mean, I, I can imagine with your nearly 20 years of experience in the events industry mm. never have would you have seen the disruption that you've seen this year um and what a time to be alive no, no. hey <laughs> yeah yeah definitely uh, yeah it's it, you know it's, it's it's definitely strange having you know having traveled so much for the events and obviously because of the, the nature of the events that i run they're, they're an international event, you know, a big bulk of our audience is made up of international clientele. So we don't necessarily just run an event that's, that's geared towards the local market because the nature of the research is international. So the audience is international, you know, uh, many of the events I'd have people from the US, Canada, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, I have people attending from South Africa. We have speakers from South Africa. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's true and obvious. So, yeah, they're truly global meetings. So the difficulty now is that when is that likely to return to normal, you know? Yeah, and I think the, the, the global nature of what you're doing really does add that level of complexity that, you know, really will make it difficult to sort of predict how your events will look in the future. I'm thinking just for a bit of context and a bit of background, um, what are you dealing with at the moment in the UK? What, what, are, what does the business look like? How's the COVID affected you? Um, what are the restrictions sitting at? We'd love to sort of, sort of see where, what, what's happening in the UK at the moment. Yeah, sure. Well, basically, um, like I say, we had big plans for 2020, you know, building on the success of last year. So we actually, the event we did last year was very much a C-focused event. It was called Europe CBD Expo. But I decided to increase the scope of it to incorporate much more in the medical cannabis space. So, you know, we, we sort of made some ripples, let's say, in the UK market and obviously Europe as well. So we expanded the concept and rebranded as Europe Canna Expo, obviously to reflect the increased scope of the meeting. And uh, we launched another event in March of this year. We had ECE Dublin, 
And uh, we were very fortunate because uh, we ran the event a, a week before Ireland went into lockdown. So it was very fortunate. We, we ran it at the Shelbourne Hotel, which is pretty much the flagship venue, the flagship hotel within Dublin. And uh, we had we had a great feedback again. We had clinicians, we had a number of patients, we had uh, a number of researchers come in from Canada and the US, Israel again, because obviously Israel, there's a hell of a lot of research going on there. So, um, yeah, we were looking to build on the platform that we'd already sort of like established and uh, watch in Dublin was an excellent event. And um, then a week later, obviously it went into lockdown. So it, we didn't really appreciate then how long the lockdown was going to be. We were still anticipating running our London event at the end of June. Um, so the plans that I'd put in place pretty much went down in flames quite quickly because we were looking at running London in June and then I had another event. I still got it in the plans at the moment. It's in uh, Zagreb, Croatia in October. Um, it's highly unlikely that that will be happening now because, again, um, the nature of our audience, it's an international audience. It, it was going to be quite quite geared towards the local market because we're partnering with the Croatian government as well to uh, actually access their sort of, uh, well, like the Chamber of Commerce as it would be in the UK. Um, so, yeah, we've pretty much, uh, well, obviously we, we postponed London from this year. We were aiming to run it in 2020 if possible, but it now seems that's highly unlikely because our venue, XL, the flagship venue in London, is still set up as a hospital. So, yeah, so the, the way it hits us basically is that, you know, in March of this year, the, the whole of the UK went into lockdown around about the 20th. So we stopped obviously working in the office. We were all working from home for about a month. And then uh, because 90%, 95% of our operation is as an event business, 95% of our revenue went up in smoke pretty much within the first six weeks because no one's going to be booking for an event that it might not even happen so um yeah so we were we were fortunate that we managed to run run dublin uh we then postponed london and we've been on furlough ever since so that's pretty much the uh, I, I suppose the good and the bad side to it is the fact we're on furlough but we were fortunate enough to be furloughed by the government so yeah. that helped us out dramatically yeah. because without that as a young business as well you know we've only been running since the end of 2018 so um it hits pretty hard really yeah so well, at the moment what, what yeah, is, sorry. what's furlough Yeah, it's a, it's a word I'd never really heard of up until about six months ago. So basically what it means is you're, 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 the government pays up to 80% of your wages, but it's only up to a cut-off amount, to a certain amount, and I believe it's around about £2,500, which is very generous, but obviously um, it's still only 80%. And being in, um, being in a sales environment you know the bulk of your money is made up from commissions so um what it comes down to is that the furlough is paid on your basic salary rather than any average earnings or anything like that but the the odd thing about it were the rules where the, the government said okay you're on furlough now you're not allowed in the office you're not allowed to do any work Okay, so yeah, so from our perspective, that seems a little bit strange because, yeah, I can understand if they don't want you generating money, but in the same way, I don't really see how that would be an issue for them because the whole idea is you want the economy to keep moving anyway. So you'd, you'd assume that by paying people and having them stay at home, you'd rather them actually use their time effectively to help better their business if they're able to do so, but that wasn't didn't really seem to be the case. So uh, the way it works for us is obviously you're able to volunteer your time if you want to. So we've, you know, we've all volunteered our time to make sure that our company stays stays relevant and that we keep in touch with our customer base because it's all about our customer service and instilling confidence in them. They're changing the terms of the furlough ag agreement. Uh, it's going to be reduced in September and then reduced again in October and then supposedly ending at the end of October with people to return to their job function, as it were. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, and so, so great to 
hear at least there's that support from the government um, and, you know, look, at it's being extended out to, to September or October. Um, when mm. is, is that when the government's expecting for, for you know, all of the uh, restrictions to lift? Well, no, you see, th th this is the thing. With, with regards to the litany restrictions, like, we were a bit late. In all honesty, we were a bit late over here. We were a bit late shutting down and we were, we were a little bit early opening up. If you look at, you know, look at the other European states, you know, Italy, Spain, Germany in particular, we were a bit behind the times, but that, that doesn't really surprise me in the UK. We always, we always, you know, sing our own tune, let's say, whether that's right or wrong. But um, the fact is, the... The lockdowns have been lifted now quite dramatically and there's there's local lockdowns going in place if there's any any further flare-ups or anything like that but the way it works is that the government have pretty much paid lip service to everyone because they've come up with these rules that you're not allowed to break and then a number of uh, highly recognizable members of government broke their own rules so there wasn't a lot the government could do apart from relax relax those rules because otherwise they're going to be even more hypocritical than they they, they seem to be already so they did it almost against the you know the scientific and healthcare advice they're like oh well we've got to get on with it now we've got to change the narrative because otherwise people are going to be seeing that it's one rule for them and another for us so they started lifting it and you know, to be fair, people over here, are, you know, we get on with it, really. You know, as much as it does need to be a bit more mandated with regards to the wearing of masks inside, I don't necessarily agree with it outside, but, you know, it's all a little bit sort of cryptic, to say the least, and they're sort of like they drip feed you information. So, but they, the thing is with it, they seem to be concentrating much more on different industries. They haven't really addressed the event industry effectively. Supposedly now they're bringing in um, a couple of like trial events in September, and if it all goes well, we're going to be opening up the event industry in October. Now I can't see that happening effectively because the events industry is built on a decent audience. If you don't have an audience, yeah, don't get me wrong, you'll be able to get speakers, you'll be able to get exhibitors and sponsors because people need, like from a speaker's perspective, they need to be promoting their work and what they do. And from an exhibitor or sponsor, they need to promote their services and, and products. But the audience, they need an audience to promote these things too. And, and if the audience is still cagey about going into large air-conditioned venues, and you know meeting people face to face you're not going to be shaking hands with people in the way that we used to so I, I, that's going to be the main the main issue it's actually getting in the in the audience whether or not the government have lifted all the sanctions or whatever you know yeah i i, I think that's really interesting because we're going to get to that point where it, they're going to it's almost like it's going to flick the switch and it's like okay events are happening but I feel like this is like the, the yeah. biggest worldwide giant social experiment and around the people that I know and it sounds that, that you know, some people that, that you know and even yourself, you know, you, we're changing our behaviours and our habits because we deep down actually have concerns about this virus and, you know, it's interesting to, yeah. to sort of hear, hear you say about the, the audience side. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's going to be a permanent thing but... Um, it's definitely going to be quite a while where people aren't going to want to commit to a particular date mm. because, well, what if there is a, you know, another outbreak or, you know, what if I can't travel and my insurance doesn't cover me or all those sorts of things as well. But um, yeah. is there any other, any other sort of things that you're thinking that are going to have sort of a permanent effect on, on the industry and in the regions that you work in? Yeah, I think I, I think the industry has been damaged beyond complete repair. To be to be totally truthful, because the fact is, there's always going to be a sector of the audience which is going to be uncomfortable when it comes to live interactions. You can see now the, with the fact that there's still many people that are in lockdown in essence through their own through their own volition you know they're basically they're at home they haven't been out they might have you know an immunosuppressive disorder there may be other comorbidities that are going to affect them and make them more more liable to contract a, a, you know a, a deadlier case let's say of covid because in essence we still don't really understand the nature of the disease effectively you know we're getting mixed messages coming out from the world health organization from the government all the time so i don't really believe Live events are going to get back to how they were even a year ago 
within the next five years, really. Um, I'm hoping, obviously, that it's a lot less than that, 18 months to two years. But in order to audience feel safe and also the people you know because the audience what you got to remember in like a large-scale trade show the audience isn't necessarily there all day long they're going to come and go but when it comes to exhibitors and sponsors they're there from pretty much eight in the morning to late at night in these large exhibition spaces so you know you've got to think about their safety and well-being and they're they're going to have more of a, a higher viral load at, Sort of like, well, you know, they're going to be in front of it much more than an audience that's going out, going outside, sitting in the sun for a bit, coming back in. So, you know, the audience numbers and you've, you've got to you've got to reduce your audience numbers because you're going to need to implement social distancing measures in some form. However, that will work. So that in itself is going to affect the industry dramatically because, you know, a lot of the money that comes is that comes in is from your audience. Mm-hmm. And it's not just that the money that can you response exhibitors is based on a, a key number uh, of attendees that they're looking to target and if you can't attract the same number say the venue would hold 5,000 people realistically you know you're gonna have to reduce that by half yeah. you know to be fair you might be able to get it to three thousand three and a half thousand but you know if you've got to be keeping six feet apart from everyone two meters one meter whatever it may be yeah, you're going to have to reduce the audience numbers. And when it comes to the conference spaces, you know, you know, very much a big part of our events is the educational program. So we're very, we, we feel that the conference sessions are, you know, so key to everything that we do in order to get our message across, to get people to understand what the latest research is and to educate people. Now, if you're going to, it's going to be like the cinemas, you know, with all these empty seats and things like that. And it's, you know, the... That in itself is, is causes problems for like event organisers because you're going to have to double up your space, you're going to have to double up your costs. So unless these venues come in and realise that by reducing their costs, I'm happy to take double the space. Don't worry, but I'm not going to pay double the price. Yeah. Because I'm going to have half the audience, so it doesn't, you know, it's not financially viable in such, in that way in order to do it. So it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit worrying, but I, I must say the, the way I do look at it is um, we've seen like a massive uptake in virtual events. Now, I've actually run a number of virtual events myself with the, in the life science space, and um, I like them. I like them a lot, but and they serve a good part of the actual of the mar- of the target market, let's say. But they're very, very different. They're a di- completely different proposition to a live, you know, person to person interactive event. You know, that that's the thing. You can't really get the you can't get, you can build the rapport with people, but you can't get that instant attraction and the instant understanding that you have when you're dealing with someone directly in front of you i'm a big believer in like the personal touch and the personal approach so i think the best way to approach it really i thought i alluded to it a bit earlier with the fact that you know you've got to keep the audience comfortable and make sure that they feel safe so i think a good area moving forward is going to be hybrid events where you have a live element but you also have a virtual element as well now, I used to run those um, when I was running the events in Asia. We, we did a couple of hybrid events. Now, they're good. They're good to do, and I like them. But the, 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 the issue with them, they, you have a lot of like technic- you can have a lot of technical issues that you need to overcome in order to make it run seamlessly. And it can be quite a big investment as well. And also, that you're then relying on the virtual elements that you have Uh, People in other countries, you know, I was running the event in Singapore. I had virtual speakers coming in from Canada, the US and Australia. So the liaison between sure it all fits in perfectly is very much like you like what you do yourself. It's like you interview another four or five people as well as me now and making sure it's live and making sure nothing drops. So the actual investment into that as well is a lot higher than a lot of companies actually appreciate. So especially if you want to, you know, if you want it to look like it's not an afterthought. But I do see that's going to be a very big area, hybrid events. So that's something that we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's um, it's crazy to even consider the fact that, you you know, you're not only are you competing with venues because they're now hospitals, um, you know, or there's (laughs) venues that, um, you know, next year when there's been an entire year worth of events cancelled, there's also going to be competition from people wanting those venues. So you're going to, not only yeah. you're going to have to double the space, you have half the amount of availability and all this competition. Mm-hmm. And then, 
you know, how do you bring value to your exhibitors and how do you bring a value to your audiences? And I, I think that mm. you know, the money, I mean, the hybrid space is, is definitely something that's, you know, catching, catching on and that there's so much complexity around that. Um, but I guess, you know, mm. the, the industry that you work in um, is, is such a booming industry and there's so much new uh, studies and, and products coming out uh, every year, not being able to connect with yeah. your clients and not having your exhibitors being able to connect with their clients um, is just not really an option. So I'd love to, um, you know, talk yeah. what, sort of, what sort of things are you thinking about introducing um, for your show next year and, and hopefully you're in a position to hold it, hold it next year. Well, I, well, we were going to have, well, I don't know, 150 exhibitors, 120 speakers this year, you know. So what I've done, I've actually changed it quite dramatically. I've gone back to a similar size that we ran last year so that we don't overcommit because we knew we delivered effectively on that. We actually over-delivered based on what our plans were. So we've, we've uh, cut the size back to around about 80 exhibitors. Uh, I've changed the format of the conference as well to make it uh, reduce the number of speakers. We're still going to be looking at over 60 speakers, but uh, I'm trying to bring it in a few more panel discussions rather than more of the lectures so that we've got a lot more interaction with the audience. We're definitely going to have a virtual element for the people that don't want to travel. Um, we're bringing in a recruitment space as well next year. So it's going to be a recruitment zone where obviously people looking to get into the cannabis space can meet with people working in the field already. So we're bringing in the recruitment space. Uh, I'm bringing in training courses as well. I'm running two half day training courses on the days before the event because the event itself is split between a B2B day and also B2B and B2C because we, we split the event in that way so that we can cater to the, the relevant sectors, the audience with more business focused topics on the first day, then much more of a consumer focus on the second day. So when I say consumers, I, I mean also patients and clinicians as well, because the key thing is all about bringing in the education for people from the doctors all the way down so people can understand what's available to them. The, the key thing for us is that we establish ourselves as an education provider. Okay, it gives you much more uh, credibility. We're not we're not in this for the short term. We're not here just to make a quick buck. You know, the whole idea is we're here to actually change the cannabis space in Europe and the UK in particular by bringing in the global experts that are already operating in the space and have been for in excess of twenty years, twenty five years. So. We want people to actually understand that because the propaganda that's out there against this misunderstood plant is is quite bizarre. You you see what it's like in Australia yourself, you know. You've got Southern Australia, which allows you to grow seven plants, and then you've got places, well, I don't know, you've got, I don't know, Western Australia, wherever it may be, you know, where it's still illegal and you can't even get CBD. You know, CBD is on prescription for a lot of you guys. Now... Here is a different kettle of fish, but they still don't really understand it because the plant's not been researched effectively. Um, there's so much misinformation out there. So it, it's key for us to make sure that we're seen to be an education provider. Fantastic. And that's why I think meetings, exhibitions and conferences are, are so important because getting, getting the right messaging across the world and to the right people and helping, you know, stale governments to understand that the world is changing and, and we need products like this. And I think it's so amazing that you, you're sort of reinventing your exhibition and conference to make sure that you're able to reach as many people as possible. I'm, I'm on reflection after hearing you, hearing you talk, I'm thinking around how many more people, um, you know, by adding this virtual element to it, how many more people you actually might be able to reach beyond um, the yeah. pandemic as well. And, and do you think that you'll keep that element um, into the future, even past uh, any of the restrictions that we have? Yeah, definitely. Because like I say, you know, there there is a, a huge investment for companies to actually bring this in. So it's not something that you want to use once and then put on the shelf, you know. These are the sort of things we've got to realise that the world is a different place now. We've got to change with the times and make sure that people actually do feel comfortable whether they are there at a live event you know we need to have the restrictions in place that makes them feel comfortable 
but there's going to be a lot of people that you know won't be able to attend you know you have to bear in mind we deal with a lot of patients all the time so we have patients on our panels and you know and some of these patients they they have to jump through hoops in order to get to our event you know important for us to have that virtual element because there's going to a big number of people that we won't reach with a live event and we want them to be able to understand what we're trying you know what are the message that we're trying to get across to people and also you know we like i said we're there to educate people so the the virtual element will will be retained without a doubt and um you know it's important as well that what we're trying to do like i mentioned the the training courses that we're going to be bringing in now they're live training courses but they're also going to have a virtual element as well if people want to actually you know, if people want to actually remote learn that information, there's yeah, we can do that. The people we're working with actually pro provide remote training courses. That's their business model at the moment. So we're we're changing that for them to uh, bring in live 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 training as well. So, but yeah, the the virtual element is going to be key. And it, yeah, it's it's what the world needs really. Yeah, and look, I, yeah. I think that that's a really great um, part of the process, and, and what people are learning now is that additional opportunities yeah. as before we really thought about the live event being you know the place to be um, if you can't be there maybe we'll videotape it or point a camera and show you what you missed out on yeah. now the way that yeah. people are innovating and changing how they do events to be able to reach the people from across the world and things like training and even though you're going to have a live element of the training online there's also that opportunity to mm. have that on-demand training and an additional revenue source for the, you know, potentially the whole year to be able to sort of capture that content from the live event and and really think about mm. that monetizing that around the around the year as well. So I think that there's some really great benefits um, to this disruption. I mean, I would much happily I would happily go back to February this year, or actually we should think pre-COVID to save everyone. I would love to go back to that moment, but I think that some of the innovations and um, the changes that are coming through uh, this this disruptive period are, are really great for our industry as well. Yeah, definitely. It's like I said, you've got to change with the times, you know. It, this has been thrust upon us, so all you can do is make the best of a bad situation. Um, it's, it's not really ever going to get back to how we remember it. Um, I even think like the handshake may be dead. You see everyone banging elbows and everything now. It's like, okay, I'm very much one for a handshake. So um, hopefully we, we haven't lost it, but yeah, yeah. we shall see. Eh? I'd be really sad to lose the whole idea of a handshake. I remember as a child being taught how to give a proper handshake and I was always proud of it and I'd hate that to be exactly because it is, you know, such a, a big part of that introduction of, of meeting someone. I also love a good hug too. So, you know, I'm a little bit sad if the hugs are taken out of our our um, normal daily life. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely, you know, and people, this is the thing about the whole lockdown, you know, people are losing that personal touch. It's all well and good doing it on Google Meet or Zoom or whatever, but the fact is it's that it's the human element okay you know we can all we can all look at each other on a screen it's no big deal but you know it's, it's nice to be able to gauge people effectively when they're in front of you their bridge and you know you know you don't what is it 70 percent of your communication is with your body not your voice so you know it says a lot really yeah so. yeah no that's really interesting um and then you know adding to that that uh complexity around that as well or you know we're going to be wearing face masks and we can't even see when someone's happy or sad you know that's that's the other part of it. So yeah. those visual cues yeah, will, be, yeah. will be certainly gone for a while, sadly. Yeah, definitely. See, that's the thing. The, the, the whole face mask thing, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a big believer in it. But, yeah, it's going to be funny when you see it at events. It really will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, yeah so, um, well, the thing is at the moment, you know, my understanding is our, our venue is, is going to be a hospital until March of next year. So that gives you some idea as to what the powers that be believe is going to really be happening. You know? Wow, that's just an insane. It's so um, it's so great to see what you're doing. I mean, it's it's sad that um, you know that that there's not going to be that that potential possibility for large live events really this year in your region. But it's so great that you're so committed yeah. to making sure that. 
um, your, your event is going to be successful into the future and you're really connecting people from all over the world regardless of the situation that they're in and been so amazing um, to sort of talk through what you're planning and um, I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with on that, that hybrid space and, and some of those other elements that you're working on. I'm thinking, you know, just um, to close off on a positive note, um, what would be your number one business or personal lesson that you've learnt through this process that you probably would never have learnt except for COVID? Well, it sort of dawned on me a bit, really, that you can't take life too seriously. You know, it's um, I've I've always been an optimist. I'm always an optimist. In you know, the, the glass is always half full for me. It's really made me realise that you know you just have to take every opportunity that's put in front of you, and you know, really make the most of your life because you really don't know what's around the corner. You know, I know people that died from COVID, and Dan. Wow. To be fair, it's. Um, yeah, they're not the sort of people that you thought were going to be effective. They didn't think they were going to be affected by it. So, yeah, you know, it makes you realise, you you know, a little bit of your own mortality. So my, my takeaway really in life and in business is just take the opportunities that present themselves to you. Create those opportunities by being open to them. And just just be happy as much as you can, you know. Life's too short to worry about it, you know. Yeah, I Sorry. love that. That's great. And I think, um, I think you're on the money. Positivity uh, you yeah. know, you can't change the situation personally, but you can change other people's yeah. lives by smiling, trying to bring them up and, and trying to see the forest through the trees and, yeah. and, and know when um, life may not get Definitely. better tomorrow, but it will get better sometime. And if not, we might as well just appreciate it today. So uh, you know. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, the, the thing is, you know, you, it's, you can't change a situation. All you can do is change how you react to it. So that's got to be key for everyone, really. Yeah, oh, I love it. You've made me put a bigger cool. smile on my face. I think that's that's really great to hear. And I just want to say cool. thank you so nice much you. again for getting up early no and joining cool. me and mm. uh, really great to chat to you and look forward to following your journey. Thanks a lot, Libby. You've got yeah. a free ticket for next year, don't worry. I'll, I'll be there. I will be on the plane <laughs> as soon as I can. <laughs> Sounds good. Paul.